The Sega Dreamcast is still to this day one of my favorite video game consoles. Although it might have had one of the strongest console launches of all time when it was released, the upcoming PlayStation 2 and a plethora of other varying factors led to, unfortunately, not just the fall of the Dreamcast, but to Sega as a console manufacturer. That's definitely not a fault of the games though. Not only did it have the best versions of some of the cross PlayStation 1 and Nintendo 64 multiplats, but it also had exclusives for days. Even now, in 2020, after years of ports, the Dreamcast still has plenty of reasons to get one. But on March 31st, 2001, Sega announced that they were piecing out from the console industry and going third party. While some, myself included, might have considered the Xbox somewhat of a spiritual successor to the Dreamcast, it would never be the same. But a third party Sega meant that they could potentially make more money, get a bunch of exclusivity deals, and ideally, make some good ass games. Nowadays, people might look at Sega as that company that milks Sonic, dances with Miku when publishes Atlas games, but in the 2000s, they were busy. They could have pulled an Atari, left the console business, and fizzled out over a couple years, but they're still thriving to this day. This video series is going to be taking a look at Sega joining the ranks of Capcom and Konami, becoming a third-party publisher, and staying afloat. This is Life After a Dream. Yo, it's Austin, and before we get started with today's video, I want to take a sec to talk to you guys about today's sponsor, GlassesUSA.com. <laughs> we legit now. GlassesUSA is an online retailer that cuts out the middleman and offers prescription glasses at up to 70% off retail prices without ever leaving home. In fact, a uh, complete pair of glasses starts at around $30, which is a pretty great deal right now. You could get something like this, or this one, which I actually have never tried this look before, and I think... I'm nailing it. This is extremely useful right now considering you should be staying at home and if you aren't, I'm watching you. They offer over 4,000 styles of eyeglasses and sunglasses from in-house and designer brands like Oakley and Ray-Ban and almost every pair can be ordered with your prescription. Glasses USA sent me a bunch of pairs to show off to you guys like these really nice Ray-Bans, but the one I was really interested in wearing was the prescription sunglasses, which I did not know that they made. And it's a game changer. One of the cool things if you did lose your prescription is a app scanner that will actually use your phone and a computer to determine your prescription and you'll be able to just buy from the site. You don't even have to go anywhere. It's great. One of the other ones I was really excited to try out was the game specs, which are the yellow tinted glasses that you would use when you're editing video or playing games and looking at a screen for a long period of time. And I pretty much just wear these all the time now. I'm a gamer. And of course, they have the same style and different colors. You could get the classic black frame or you could do something a little more goofy. Green and purple, y'all. So if you need and want new eyeglasses, you can't really beat the convenience here. So please click the link down in the description to get a special offer from GlassesUSA.com just for you guys. Now, on with the show. So yo, it's Austin, and I'm a disgusting Sega Mark who will take the Genesis over the Super Nintendo any day, and welcome to part one of a series that I'm calling Life After a Dream. That's right, we're gonna be talking about Sega following the demise of the Dreamcast. That means we're talking about the Xbox, we're talking about the PlayStation 2 multi-platform, Engage, maybe? It had some exclusives. There's a lot of ways that I could do this, but I figured the best way would be to go from console to console, that way we could focus on the exclusives. And I don't think there's a better way to start off this series than saying this illegal sounding combination of words, Sega on the Nintendo GameCube. It still feels weird. It still feels weird. Back in the day, I don't think anyone ever expected to see Sonic the Hedgehog appear on a Nintendo console, let alone attend the Olympics together or, you know, become a part of the Super Smash Brothers roster. But way before all of that, seeing the words Nintendo and Sega on the same box just looked wrong. While all the other consoles would get a plethora of exclusives from the new publisher, the GameCube was Sega's go-to for ports and enhanced version of Dreamcast games. I don't want to spend too much on these as there's a lot of exclusives we gotta cover, so I'll just name a few. The most obvious, of course, Sonic Adventure DX and Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. While these might be infamous these days, I'll still eternally love both of the Sonic Adventures. Both of these are practically the same as the original, with a few fixes or uh, additional bugs in some cases. Though, the GameCube version of 2 is immediately inferior because of Big the Cat's unjust removal from the multiplayer. A shame. There were also the two major JRPG ports, Fantasy Star Online and Skies of Arcadia Legends. Both of these are very 
very good versions of those games. Fantasy Star Online Episode 1 and 2 is an extremely ahead of its time MMORPG that will absolutely get its own video in the upcoming months. This collection actually spawned its own, still to this day, GameCube exclusive game, Fantasy Star Online Episode 3. The multiplayer action MMO decided to become a turn-based card game, one that is very, very slow and not even close to what I or any PSO fan probably wanted, but it, it's okay. More on that another time. Skies of Arcadia Legends is the Persona 4 Golden of the Dreamcast, a better version of an amazing Sky Pirate JRPG with endearing characters, music, and a killer story. Sure, sign us all up. This one's harder though, because you can't tell that a random battle is about to happen based on the sound of your Dreamcast. So let's move into the meat. Ton of those Dreamcast games will get ported to not just the GameCube, but other varying consoles still to this day. However, there's a lot of Sega GameCube exclusives that haven't been ported to anything further. So we might as well start from the actual beginning with the one that people probably remember the most, Super Monkey Ball. This here is Toshihiro Nagoshi, the director of Monkey Ball and the Yakuza series. But prior to a slow transformation into looking like one of Kiryu's enemies, he made a little game about monkeys and balls. One that did so well overseas that Sega viewed the guy as a prodigy. And well, considering how good the Super Monkey Ball games are, I don't blame them. It's a simple concept. It's like Marble Madness, but with cute screaming monkeys. You're a ball, you get into the hole, and you collect bananas with big old dull stickers on them. Cross brand synergy. It's the most gamey game you can possibly imagine, but sometimes that's just what the doctor ordered. Around this time, Sega was the king of the arcade game. The Dreamcast had a ton of first party titles that had that arcade charm like Crazy Taxi or Zombie Revenge. Monkey Ball's like you got three lives, you got one goal. It's it's simple, you the, do the one thing. The transition between levels and deaths is nearly instantaneous and those levels rarely take longer than a minute. The controls are extremely tight the music has that early 2000s synth funk thing going on, and it's widely known as a solid speedrunning game even to this day. There's also a handful of mini games, one of which is debatably just as good as the original game. There's Monkey Billiards, Monkey Bowling, Monkey Golf, which are all exactly what they sound like, but the real juicy bit here is Monkey Target. You and up to three others gotta speed roll down a giant ramp, launch into the sky, attempt to take flight and land on a target in the middle of the ocean all while collecting floating bananas. <sighs> I might have played this with friends even more than the original mode, to be honest. It's just pure joy. Super Monkey Ball was a gym all over and was basically printing money, so of course, Super Monkey Ball 2 would come out for the GameCube the next year, but this time with lore. <laughs> This, this is very important if you can't tell. Super Monkey Ball 2 is a lot of people's go-to with this franchise, and I can see why. It's a little more of the same, a little more polished, a little more featured, a little more dolled up, and overall a fantastic multiplayer game that's still good today. Turns out putting balls into holes is an evergreen concept. The main difference here are just new level mechanics like switches that activate things mechanics. It's good. It's a good game. But the main thing to take away from Super Monkey Ball 2 is not that it is a good game, but that it was used in a medical research study. Turns out if you play at least six minutes before performing a surgical procedure, you will surge better. And next time I get a kidney transplant, I'll make sure to beg the doc to do an intermediate course. There's a lot more Monkey Ball that's still going to this day, including a compilation on the Xbox and PlayStation 2, but that's for later. Don't worry, we'll talk about Deluxe, the best one. If we were to go in the order from beginning to end, next up would be a ton of sports games. Now, I'm sure a lot of you guys remember, but before EA decided to just buy up the rights to football itself, the Sega 2K games were actually pretty good. Sega's always been good with sport games, especially of the arcadey variety. If anyone out there has played Virtua Tennis, you know what's up. But the GameCube did get a couple of exclusive sports games, and we're gonna talk about them, cause we thorough. Home Run King. It's baseball. Virtua Striker 2002. Soccer, or uh, football. Except this one has Sonic and friends as an unlockable team. This is like a weird uncanny valley thing. But I will say this, this right here, this gives me joy. I had forgotten that they were also making really dry sim sports games around this time. A couple of the good ones are multi-plat, but the one notable exclusive that stands out the most in the GameCube is a volleyball game. And uh, I have no shame. So this here is Beach Spikers Virtual Beach Volleyball. That's beach two times in the title and a big stain. Wasn't me. 
What's with the early 2000s in beach volleyball video games? They've always been around, but when the sixth gen of consoles rolled out, it was relentless. On top of beach spikers, we had Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball, Outlaw Volleyball, Summer Heat Beach Volleyball, Klonoa Beach Volleyball. One of these is not like the other. That's just in 2002 to 2003, by the way. I guess now that we could show the world what a video game sweaty tanned body looked like, it was time to do it. A lot. But thankfully, despite listing beautiful female athletes as a feature on the back of the box, Beach Spikers plays it pretty straight and is way better than it has any right to be. Exactly what I expected. It's more in depth than extreme. It's not as trashy as Outlaw. It's a, it's a volleyball video game, but one where everyone looks greasy and Sonic the Hedgehog watches over all. Sponsored by Pringles. One with social aspects such as screaming at your partner. Also sponsored by Pringles. In fact, this entire court seems to be sponsored by Pringles. Pringles. Good God. Thank you, Mr. Pringle. Thank you. There's a custom career mode where you'd make a duo of volleyballers to try and reach the heights of championship, but when you start out, your partner's bad. <laughs> like, like really bad. They get better the more you play and the more you yell at or praise them, but sometimes a little encouragement isn't gonna do much when you're this bad. Uh, it's okay, it's okay, you'll do better next time. How's your head? Just about every Sega published GameCube game would make it out of Japan, with the exception of just one non-sports title. But that's okay, because it was a Bleach fighting game. Ah, uh, nothing to see here. Next up is a game that just radiates GameCube energy. When you get Sega, you get Sonic Team. And when you get Sonic Team, that means you can put, by the creators of Sonic the Hedgehog, Right on the box, produced by Yuji Naka himself, in 2003, we would get Billy Hatcher and the Giant Egg. Billy Hatcher and the Giant Egg is one of those games that is 300% up my alley. And if you've seen my weird 3D platformers video, you know I've already talked about it before. Billy Hatcher is packed full with creativity. It's got a banging soundtrack. It's got a really innovative main mechanic with the egg tech. You take control of Billy here, who gains the power of the legendary chicken suit so he can free the elder chickens. And saying this out loud is ridiculous, but it's a perfectly good kids platformer with a decent amount of challenge and a whole a lot of jank. Exactly what I expected. Sometimes jumping or platforming feels extremely bad due to odd physics, but you can usually come back from it pretty quick. Billy feels a lot like Sonic Team looking at the mission-based structure of Mario 64 and attempting to do something like that. Each world has multiple objectives and even multiple characters you can play as when you go through and save your friends, who all have cool names like Bantam Scrambled and Chick Poacher. Very cool. You basically just want to grab an egg, which will grow in size Katamari style as you pick up coins and run over enemies. Then you can hatch it into a power up or an item. You can jump around with it or like hit dudes. Egg things. I like eggs. Eat that shit raw. There's a lot of potential here, but that early 2000s Sonic Team looseness definitely leaves its mark. Still one of those games that's worth your shot if you ever get a chance. Pretty surprised that Sega never attempted to port this one besides the PC in Europe in 2006. It's been four 14 years. The most Billy Hatcher we got is in a Sonic racing game made by Sumo. If you want to see more of my thoughts on this, check out this video at some point, because for now, we gotta go fast. Except like 700 miles an hour faster than that hedgehog could ever dream of going, because next up is the first time that Nintendo ever let Sega work with one of its IPs. And made by the same division that made Super Monkey Ball would be F-Zero GX. If having these two companies in the same box wasn't weird enough, putting in a Nintendo published game and seeing the words Sega in the corner was enough to blow a kid's mind back in the day. In a big collaborative effort between the two formal rivals and Amusement Vision, both F-Zero GX and AX came out in 2003, both supporting a unique cross-save function where you could put in your GameCube memory card into the arcade cabinet for special features. You could also take home a little license card with your character and stats that you could use to save your progress. I lost mine 100 years ago, which sucks, but uh, you know what doesn't suck? This game, F-Zero GX, was the home version of that arcade cabinet, and it still might be, to this day, not just the best F-Zero title, but the best futuristic racing game of all time. I know, that's a lot. Up until this point, F-Zero had been on consoles that couldn't really bring out the full world speed and chaos that the GameCube could do. Looking at the original on the Super Nintendo in comparison feels like a different series. F-Zero 64 is kind of just eh. But GX moves at speeds that would make you think this little purple cube had blast processing. Each race would put you up against 29 other racers where any one of you could potentially be out of the running in a second with a crash draining your energy or a self-imposed yeet off the cliff. Each 
of the over 40 racers and vehicles has a unique design that says a lot about their personalities, even if they barely say anything. Can you tell us why you became an F-Zero racer? Galaxy Dog was running at a loss. Thank you for the interview. I always like to main James McLeod because, I mean, it's Star Fox. That's an R-Wing. What do you want from me? I'm a simple man. Kate Allen was pretty cool too, but I have no idea how this outfit made it into a Nintendo game. In 2003. What? <sighs> this game rules. It's not like GX was extremely innovative or original. The franchise at this point had been around for a decade, and there's other amazing games in the same sector. Wipeout, Extreme G, and Episode 1 Pod Racing immediately come to mind. The unrealistic, arcadey Future Racer is one of my favorite types of video games, but it's harder to get much better than F-Zero GX. I'm assuming that Nintendo also feels that way, because this thing came out 17 years ago, and besides a Game Boy Advance game and a few Captain Falcon appearances in Smash, this franchise has gone silent. But really, I have no idea how any developer would be able to top this nearly perfect video game, so you might as well just port this to the Switch and call it a day. Good job, Sega. You, you did good. Too good. You ruined it for everyone. You bastards. It's hard for me to declare the best game by a publisher on a console, and while I would say Fantasy Star Online if it wasn't a port, I gotta hand it to F-Zero GX. That game just rules. But I'm done talking about the good stuff. I wanna talk about weird games. Well, there's a lot more to offer on the other consoles and portables. There's only one GameCube exclusive left of note, and it's... Does anyone know Amazing Island? Probably not that many, which is ironic, considering one of the developers was called Hitmaker. Nice. Amazing Island is a video game comprised entirely of mini games. This isn't an uncommon thing. In fact, it's a type of game that's still very popular today, something Sega excels at even. Oh, this game's a lie now, huh? But you know what is original? Video games with avatar creation. What have I done? Amazing Island kind of just flopped out in 2004, and I had no idea it existed until a few years ago. In fact, I only realized it was a thing when I was trying to look up video game soundtracks that my boy Yuzo Koshiro had worked on, and I wasn't disappointed in that regard. <laughs> Everything else, though, is pretty weird and right up my alley. After picking a character to control, you get to start making monsters, which you will use to play minigames with. You're playing these in order to drive off the Black Evil and restore life to the Mabu tribe, and maybe they should have named the Sinister Four. Or something different. I'm not really sure how playing basketball by myself is gonna help, but okay. Anyways, let's get started with our first minigame, after of course fusing with my monster, who I gave sad hands to. First up, we got the jungle dash, which seems to be like a 50 meter sprint kind of thing. All right, let's, uh, okay then. Well, I did it. Ah, I got me some crooked eyes. All of the mini games vary in difficulty quite a bit. Sometimes they'll be done in 10 seconds like this one, or other times you'll get yourself a passing score and feel like you barely made it. Or fail multiple times back to back, not really understanding what's going on, getting a game over and kicking you back out to the beginning. None of these are blatantly terrible, they're just, they're okay. But the most interesting part of Amazing Island is the avatar creation. As you play and unlock accessories and styles via proto loot crates after every mini game, you can put these together to become your avatar. You can only have one at a time though, so let's say goodbye to my pathetic and sad dragon here named Garfield. I wanna recreate someone that everyone knows as a speedy powerhouse that wants to save the world, like Goku. Well, I tried. I, I didn't mean to make episode five of Super, but I did. Let's name him Guacamole instead. Ah, oh, Christ. Amazing Island is really freaking weird, and that's something I find endearing. When I think of the Dreamcast and Sega, it kind of just looks like something they would have made during this time period. But during this new period of freedom for the publisher, they worked on a ton of different games and new ideas, and I can't think of anything more obscure or weird than Amazing Island. A full-priced minigame collection with only 30 of them, an awkward to use and weirder to see character customization system, but with a bangin' OST. It's probably Probably the most Sega thing they could have done, and we'll never see it again. Well, that's all for the GameCube, but next time I'm gonna be talking about the Xbox, the console that virtually replaced the Dreamcast, all the way down to the two little memory slots on the controller. The GameCube definitely got the lightest batch of Sega games in the long run, but a lot of those are games that have really stood the test of time, and still are some of my favorites, like F Zero. Port F Zero. Port F Zero, please. Thanks for watching. Make sure to click the link down in the description to check out Glasses USA and save up to 70% on a brand new pair of frames.
Special Patreon shout out to Brandon Howell, Chris Shelton, Christopher Olivia, Cliff Pro, DA Stevens, Donald Doughty, David Molnar, Elon Shane Stauffenecker, Flaming Fighter, Imi, Jay Roos, Jeffrey Narvaez, Jacoby Fitzpatrick, Jordy McCaffrey, Josh Garbage Lord, Kevin Zanowski, Karen Arter, Legend Gary, and Plasma Phoenix. Thank you very much for your generous support. Thank you guys so much for watching. This is part one of Life After a Dream, and I'm really excited to bring the rest of this to you guys. I've been wanting to do this for a while, and I figured, hey, now's the time. So, uh, drink, drink milk if you can. I like it.